Thank you for tuning in to Deeper Into the Word from Hamilton Road Baptist Church. In this episode, Pastor Johnny McLaughlin teaches on the Sermon on the Mount from Matthew chapter 5. If you have any questions on what you hear, please send them to deeper at hamiltonroadbaptist.com or comment below the video online. We will base our question and answer session before next week's teaching on your questions. Well, it's great to welcome you back again to our Sunday night Bible teaching series, Deeper Into the Word. And that's what we've really enjoyed doing over these nights together, where we're going deeper into what God has said to us in the Sermon on the Mount. And we've looked at this great theme of kingdom living. What does it mean for you and for me to be kingdom people as we follow in the footsteps of Jesus Christ, the King of Kings and the Lord of Lords? And he starts this great Sermon on the Mount by talking about people who are blessed, people who are flourishing, people who are following in his footsteps. And we've studied together the first three Beatitudes. And tonight we land on the fourth one. So let's look at it in our Bible together this evening. Look at Matthew chapter 5 and verse 6. It says this, blessed are those who hunger and thirst for righteousness. Blessed are those who hunger and thirst for righteousness. But you might want to try and understand what does that actually mean? Well, let's, as we go there, try to Analyze what it means by asking ourselves a question, followed by this first statement. To a large degree, our lives will be defined by what we have hungered and thirsted for. To a large degree, our lives will be defined by what we have hungered and thirsted for. True or false? As you consider that statement, then ask yourself, is that true or false? As you look at your life, and you might want to pause the video now and ask yourself this question. Is it true that what you're hungering and thirsting for today will define your life? Jeremiah, as he speaks to the people of God, said this in Jeremiah chapter 2, verse 13. He said, my people have committed two sins. They have forsaken me, the spring of living water, and have dug their own cisterns, broken cisterns that cannot hold water. Now, what is Jeremiah talking about? He's speaking to a people that they're going to go into exile unless they turn again to God who will provide for them living water that will truly satisfy them. But instead of following God, they build their own cisterns. And these cisterns leak. It cannot satisfy them. It cannot quench their thirst. And I want you to think tonight about the world you live in in the 21st century culture. What broken cisterns has our world built that promises you, it promises me, true joy, true satisfaction, only to leave you and me hungry and thirsting for something more? Even back in Jeremiah's day, as a prophet of God, he spoke to people with the same issues that we have, only it looked different on the outside. We must turn to God. We must be hungry and thirsting for God. So we've discovered the way of Jesus on these nights together. Those who are spiritually bankrupt, week three, those who are broken. Last week, those who are meek. And tonight, blessed are those who are hungry for God. I want to ask you again at the beginning of our teaching session tonight, are you hungry for God? Do you want more of God? Do you believe that more of God is available to you tonight, that you can go deeper with him in intimacy and in fellowship and in union and communion with him? Because that's where Jesus is going tonight. Blessed are those who are hungry for me. So our overarching teaching thought is this. Blessed are those who are hungry and thirsty for God, for they will get more of him now and in the future. 
Blessed are those who are hungry and thirsty for God because they will get more of him now. And yet there's still more to come of him in the future. So we're going to make a number of movements tonight. And the first movement we're going to make is hungering and thirsting after God. We're going to seek to define it. So let's look at some of the words. The word hunger. Dictionary describes it as a craving or urgent need for food. It's a weakened position brought on by a prolonged lack of food. It's a, it's a strong desire. It's a strong craving. The other word is thirst. Dictionary defines to thirst as a sensation of dryness in the mouth and throat associated with liquids. Jesus uses both of these words. Happy or flourishing or blessed are those who are hungry for me, who are starving for me, who are craving for me. Blessed are those who are thirsting after me. Wonder is that how you feel about God tonight? Martin Lloyd-Jones said this many years ago. He said, the man who hungers and thirsts for righteousness is the man who sees that sin and rebellion have separated him from the face of God and longs to get back into that old relationship, the original relationship or righteousness in the presence of God. They dwelt and walked with him. It also means of necessity, a desire to be free from the power of sin, having realized what it means to be poor in spirit and to mourn because of sin within, we naturally come to the stage of longing to be free from the power of sin. He's alluding to Adam and Eve in the garden. They walked with God. They talked with God. Perfect union. Perfect communion. If they wanted more of God, they got more of God. But sin broke their relationship with God and now they were cast out of Eden with a flaming sword going back and forth. And every human that is born into this world lives east of Eden. And so as Jesus speaks, as the new Adam, as the true Adam, he's offering us a new way back into relationship with him and fellowship with him, where ultimately one day there will be the total absence of sin and perfect communion again. So Jesus says, is that what you long for tonight? Do you really want that? To be in perfect union and communion with me once again? So we've seen some of the definitions and let's consider the text then. Look at what it says. Blessed are those who hunger and thirst. And the word that Jesus lands on is righteousness. You say, what does the word righteousness mean? Well, it can be defined as hungering and thirsting for justice, for fulfillment, to, to be put right. Adam and Eve, after they were cast out of the garden, sin had entered into the world, and they were then broken men and women. We are all broken men and women, and so we must be hungering and thirsting for someone who has come, who can put us right, who can make us righteous. Only Jesus, God's one and only Son, could do this. And Jesus says, this must be our pursuit. This must be our desire to look for him, to make us right. Jim Elliot, who was a great missionary, hero of the past, he spoke about his spiritual hunger. As he's there in a foreign mission field away from many family members and friends, listen to what he said about his hunger and his thirst for God. He said, all I've asked has not been given. And the Father's withholding has only served to intensify my desires. He knows that the hungrier one is, the more appreciative he becomes of food. And if I've gotten nothing else from this year's experience, he has given me a hunger for himself I have never experienced before. Do you have that sort of hunger? Jim Elliot, a, a normal man like us, a normal human being. There he was on the mission field, and he said, even though God hasn't answered all of my prayers the way I would have liked them to, and no doubt he was going through many difficulties at that time, he says, God has given me an intense hunger and thirst for more of him. 
Is that how you feel tonight? But then let's go to our second teaching thought tonight, hungering and thirsting in the Old Testament. Well, consider Israel. They were God's people, and they were in Egyptian captivity for 400 years, and then God redeems them. God saves them, and then they find themselves in the wilderness. Would they be satisfied with the food that God offers? Would they be satisfied for the water that God provided? Well, listen to what's recorded for us in Exodus chapter 16, verse 1. The whole Israelite community set out from Elam and came to the desert of Sin, which is between Elam and Sinai. And on the 15th day of the second month after they'd come out of Egypt, in the desert, the whole community grumbled against Moses and Aaron. The Israelites said to them, if only we had died by the Lord's hand in Egypt. There we sat around with pots of meat and ate all the food that we wanted. But you, Moses, you've brought us into this desert to starve this entire assembly to death. They said it was better back in our old lives. The food that we used to eat, the water that we used to drink. They wanted to go back to the old cisterns. And in many ways, this can serve as an illustration for you and for me. Your life before Christ. The things that you used to partake in before you became a Christian, which you hoped and longed and starved. You were looking for God. But they were broken cisterns. And so this illustration reveals to us that that's what Israel wanted too. But what was God doing with them? Well, later on in the Pentateuch, Moses teaches us what God was doing in that time with the people. In Deuteronomy chapter 8, verse 2, remember how the Lord your God led you all the way in the wilderness these 40 years to humble you and to test you. Why, why did he starve them of food on occasions? Why did he withhold water on occasions? in order to know what was in your heart, whether or not you would keep his commands. He humbled you, causing you to hunger and then feeding you with manna, which neither you nor your ancestors had known, to teach you that man does not live by bread alone, but on every word that comes from the mouth of the Lord. Think about this. He says, your clothes did not wear out and your feet did not swell during these 40 years. Know then in your heart that as a man disciplines his son, the Lord your God disciplines you. God took simple things like food and water, and he used them to test if his people were actually hungry and thirsty for him. What about you? What things in your life could God be withholding at this time to actually test you to see what's within you? else? Israel were tested. What would the psalmist reveal? The, the psalmist or the, the great songbook of the Bible, 150 wonderful songs about God. And the psalmist reveals to us how he hungered and thirsted for God. Listen to Psalm 42 verse 1. One of the sons of Korah. As a deer pants for streams of water, so my soul pants for you, my God. It's as if there's a deer in the wilderness in Israel. And this deer sees a, a, a little stream or, or a brook. And, and when they see it, they run because they haven't had a drink for such a long time. This is the sort of intense yearning and craving that this deer has to get to the water. As the deer pants for streams of water, so our souls should pant after God. My soul thirsts for God, for the living God. When can I go and meet with God? My tears have been my food day and night. Well, people say to me all day long, where is your God? These things I remember. As I pour out my soul, how I used to go to the house of God under the protection of the mighty one with shouts of joy and praise among the festive throng. Jesus is teaching his sermon by the Sea of Galilee on a mountainside. And when Jesus says, blessed are those who hunger and thirst, they would have known, like the psalmist, what it was like to hunger and to thirst. We, in this 21st century culture, we drive around the corner and there's a garage open for us, sometimes 24-7. Food and water is available to us constantly. We never really have to worry, particularly in the West, about where the next 
meal is coming from or where the next drink is coming from. But those who listened on the mountainside to Jesus, the psalmist as he reflects on the deer panting for streams of water, they knew what it was like to feel that intense hunger, that gnawing and that aching and that craving in their inside because they haven't had food for many days. They would have known what it was like to have that intense dryness of mouth longing for just a drop of cool water. The psalmist says, Jesus says, that's the sort of intensity and desire that you need to have for God. It's the same with David. Psalm 63, verse 1, a psalm of David. And he's out in the wilderness. And he may have been hungry and he may have been thirsty. He says, verse 1, you, God, are, are my God. Earnestly I seek you. I, I thirst for you. My whole being longs for you in a dry and in a parched land where there is no water. I've seen you in the sanctuary. Behel your power and your glory because your love is better than life. My lips will glorify you. I will praise you as long as I live and in your name I will lift up my hands. I will be fully satisfied as with the richest of foods. With singing lips, my mouth will praise you. You see how David longed to have more of God. Out in the wilderness, out in the caves, on the run from Saul, the one thing he yearned for more than anything else was satisfaction in God. Israel were to long for God. The psalmist longed for God. What about the prophets? Well, in Isaiah chapter 5, verse 13, Isaiah prophesied that food would be withheld from them and water would be withheld from them if they disobeyed the Lord. Then in Isaiah 49, verse 10, he prophesies to them about what their return from exile might look like. They will neither hunger nor thirst, nor will the desert heat or the sun beat down on them. He, God, who has compassion on them, will guide them and lead them beside springs of water. Isaiah is prophesying about that time when the people would go into captivity, where they would be enslaved once again. But if they turned to God, if they yearned for more of God, if they had that intense craving for God, God would lead them once again to a place of spiritual refreshment. But the ultimate fulfillment in these beautiful words comes in the next prophecy. Isaiah chapter 55, verse 1. There's no doubt some of these words were fulfilled when the exiles returned. There's no doubt some of these words were fulfilled when Jesus came to earth. But I believe some of these words are still yet to be fulfilled with people like you and me in the new heavens and the new earth and all that is to come. Listen to these beautiful words about what Jesus is finally going to do for us. Come. All of you who are thirsty, come to the waters. And you who have no money, come. Come buy and eat. Come buy wine and milk without money and without cost. Why spend money on what isn't bread and labor on what doesn't satisfy? How that speaks to this culture today. Listen. Listen to me. And eat what is good. And you will delight in the richest of fare. God speaks through Isaiah the prophet, and he said, there's, there's only one who can truly satisfy. And you yourself, you can't pay for it. You can't buy it. You can't earn it. It can only be given to you if you have an appetite for him. Thomas Watson helps us when he says this. If a friend invites guests to his table, he does not expect that they should bring money for their dinner. Only come with an appetite. I wonder if you want to pause the recording at this point and ask yourself this question. How is my spiritual appetite? Some of you who are medical doctors might ask someone who comes into your room as a patient, you might say to them, how is your appetite? Why? 
Because from what I can understand is that if a patient is not eating, it's often symptomatic of a, a deeper issue in their body. Something internally is wrong, which causes them not to eat. And in the same way, if your appetite for God is not strong and intense tonight, I wonder, is there something internally that's competing for the space that God wants to fill? Tonight, you might just want to ask God, the Holy Spirit, to reveal perhaps that which is within you, which is preventing you from hungering and thirsting for more of Him. But our third teaching moment takes us to Christ. It takes us to Christ. All of the law in the Old Testament and all of the prophets that we've already looked at together this evening, all of them are pointing to Christ, the perfect illustration, the perfect model. And wonderfully for, for you and for me tonight who are failures, who say, Do you know what, Johnny, I, I, I just about have an appetite, but it's small. And I want it to be bigger for God. The wonderful thing is Christ has hungered and thirsted after God for us. He did it for us in the wilderness. Look at Matthew chapter 4, verse 1. It says, Then Jesus was led by the Spirit into the wilderness to be tempted by the devil. And after fasting 40 days and 40 nights, he was hungry. It's incredible when you look at the Bible that there are so many moments where Men and women failed over food and drink. In the garden, the serpent comes to Eve and offers her forbidden fruit. She takes it and she eats it. Adam comes along and he takes it and he eats it. Adam failed when he should have been hungering and thirsting after God. Eve failed when she should have been hungering and thirsting after God. Rather, they wanted to be like God, knowing good and evil. And as we've already discovered tonight in, in the Exodus and in Deuteronomy, God's people, the children of Israel, even though he had saved them, even though he had redeemed them, and he offers them supernatural manna in the wilderness and water from a rock, Israel failed over food. So we needed someone who was going to come who would show perfect hunger and perfect thirst for failures like us. And so when the serpent comes and whispers in Jesus' ear, it's recorded for us that Satan comes. He says, you know, Jesus, you've been hungry now for 40 days. These stones, well, they can come, become bread. You can have the tangible now, you can have the temporary now. But Jesus in John's gospel said he had only ever come to do the will of the one who had sent him as father. He delighted to do the will of the father. He delighted more in his relationship and his communion with God that he was willing to put aside the tangible and the temporary for the eternal plan. What a challenge for us. What an encouragement for us that Christ has done this perfectly for us. But he also does it in us. How does he do it in us? Well, in John chapter 4, there was a woman who was very promiscuous. She had led a life of large amounts of sexual immorality. And one day Jesus meets her by a well in Samaria. And really, Jesus shouldn't have been in Samaritan territory because the Jews hated the Samaritans and the Samaritans hated the Jews. And she went to the well one day in, in the brightest and the hottest parts of the day because, well, she was mocked and despised in the community. Only when she was being used and abused by another man did anybody want to see her. And Jesus meets this woman at a well. He speaks to her about where she can find living water. Jesus says to her, whoever drinks the water I give them will never thirst. And the, indeed, the water I give them will become in them a spring of water welling up to eternal life. And the woman said to him, sir, give me this water so that I won't get thirsty and have to keep coming here to draw water. Jesus, the master teacher, says, as you look into that well, just like your life, 
You're going to have to keep coming back time and time and time again to this well in order to have your thirst quenched. But if you come to me, you're going to have your thirst quenched. You're going to have your hunger satisfied. Consider the difference between Jacob's well. It was a physical well in Samaria and the well that Jesus offered. And one writer, Hendrickson, really helps us here. Jacob's well, where Jesus was talking to this woman, it could not prevent one from becoming thirsty again. In the Middle East, you have to keep coming back in a hot climate to get water in the first century. Jesus used this metaphor to to describe the very fact that he himself is a well that gives lasting satisfaction. He he then goes on to say in many ways that Jacob's well remains outside the soul. You've got to come to it. Whereas the well and the water that Jesus offers enters into our soul and remains. Christ abide in us. Christ within us. Jacob's well, a physical well, is limited in quantity. You're going to need water to come from another source to to fill it up again. But for the Christian, for this woman, if she would give her heart and her life to Christ, Christ will become in her a self-perpetuating spring, unlimited in quantity. Oh, how I long for everybody in this world to get this. That the wells that your friends and your family keep going back to who are outside of Christ, will find that they're, they're temporary. They're limited in quantity and don't truly satisfy. Jesus says, I and I alone am the only one that can provide water that will satisfy our thirsty souls. Don Carson said this about this woman after she discovers the true identity of Jesus in John 4. In her eagerness to enjoy the new and living water, she abandons the old water jar and thus speaks of renunciation of the old ceremonial forms of religion in favor of worship in spirit and truth. She actually runs into the town. And she says in a community where she's despised, because she has met Jesus, she says, come and see. Come and meet a man who told me everything I ever did. Could this be the Messiah? Could this be the one who's offering water that will quench my thirst? Is this the one who's going to offer me food that will quench the deep cravings within my heart? And the whole town came out to see him. Jesus is the only one who can satisfy our hunger and our thirst. Later in John's gospel, John records for us again some of the words of Jesus in John 7, 37, on the last and greatest day of the festival. Jesus stood and said in a loud voice, let anyone who's thirsty come to me and drink. Whoever believes in me, as scripture has said, rivers of living water will flow from within them. By this, he meant the spirit, whom those who believed in him were later to receive. And up to that time, the Spirit had not been given, since Jesus had not yet been glorified. On hearing his words, some of the people said, surely this man is the prophet. To what extent is the person and work of God, the Holy Spirit, doing his work in your life? Are you allowing him to do his work? Because Jesus said in another portion of John's gospel, in John 6, 35, he says, I am the bread of life. And I'm the only one that can satisfy the hungry and quench the thirst of the thirsty. Because Jesus is the ascended and he's the risen Lord and he sent the Holy Spirit into this world. And now as a Christian, the Holy Spirit indwells your heart and your life, and your mind, and tabernacles himself within us. And he wants to produce his fruit in our lives. But we must yield our will and our hearts to him so that we hunger and thirst for more of him. Thomas Watson said, All is nothing without Christ. Let me have Christ to clothe me. Let me have Christ to feed me. Let me have Christ to intercede for me. 
While the soul is Christless, it is restless. Nothing but the water springs of Christ's blood can quench its thirst. Jesus in Matthew 11 says, Come to me, all of you who are weary and heavy laden, and I will give you rest for your souls. For my yoke is easy and my burden is light. Only Christ can fill the deepest longings in your heart. This is what Thomas Watson says. This is what so many writers over church history have said. This is what the prophets say. This is what the law says. This is what Christ says. And then consider what Peter said. After he had lived a long life as a human who had many moments of failure like you and me, and he reflected, and I love this verse. It says in 1 Peter 2, verse 7, Now to you who believe, this stone is precious. Now to you who believe this stone is precious, who is the stone? It's Christ. Christ to him was the altogether lovely one. Christ to him was the one who had the words of eternal life. Christ to him was the bread of life. Christ to him was the light of the world. Christ to him was the gate. Christ to him was the resurrection and the life. Christ to him was the true vine. And so he said, Peter, at the end of his life, Jesus is precious. Maybe at this moment you want to pause the recording and ask yourself this question. Is Christ the greatest treasure in my life? Christ gives us his righteousness. He's perfectly shown us what it is to live this life for us. He's doing it within us. He credits his righteousness into our spiritual account. And the apostle Paul speaks of this amazing righteousness where we cannot go and get it ourselves, but Christ has come to earth and through the cross and through his death and through his burial and through his resurrection and through his ascension and the very fact that one day he's coming back again and that he lives spiritually in our hearts through the power of the Holy Spirit, Paul speaks of how he gives us his righteousness, Romans 3. But now apart from the law, the righteousness of God has been made known to which the law and the prophets testify. This righteousness is given through faith in Jesus Christ to all who believe. There is no difference between Jew and Gentile for all have sinned and fall short of the glory of God and are justified, listen to it, freely, you have no money, come freely by his grace through the redemption that came by Christ Jesus. God presented Christ as a sacrifice of atonement through the shedding of his own blood to be received by faith. The righteousness of Christ is given to you, Christian, tonight, freely. It's all of grace by faith. Isn't it wonderful to know that as glorious failures, Christ has lived this perfect life of hungering and thirsting after God for us. He then does it in us and credits his righteousness into our spiritual account because what he's done for us on the cross. But what if I've lost my spiritual appetite? What if you feel really guilty at the moment? You go, I have not been hungering and thirsting after God, and I need God to do something within me tonight. Well, consider this lovely little thought. Thomas Watson says, God will fill the hungry because of those sweet relations he stands on to them. They are his children. We cannot deny our children when they are hungry. We will rather spare it from ourselves. When he that is born of God shall come and say, Father, I hunger, give me Christ. Father, I thirst, refresh me with the living streams of thy spirit. Can God deny? Later in Luke's gospel, Luke 11, chapter 13, Jesus says, if you, though you're evil, 
if you know how to give good gifts to your children, how much more will your Father in heaven give the Holy Spirit to those who ask him, why don't you tonight just get down on your knees and ask God to give you more of himself? You'll do it. You'll do it. And it takes us to our last teaching point for just a few moments. The reward for the hungry and for the thirsty. What's the reward? Well, now we get a reward. Well, look at what it says at the end of the text. Verse 6 of chapter 5, blessed are those who hunger and thirst for righteousness, for they will be, future tense, and it's passive. Somebody has to come and fill them. Somebody has to come and fill you. It's a divine passive. God is the one who's going to do it. They will be filled. They will be satisfied. They will be content. And the psalmist speaks of this in Psalm 107 verse 8. Let them give thanks to the Lord for his unfailing love and his wonderful deeds for mankind. For he satisfies the thirsty and fills the hungry with good things. God has a reward for those who are hungry and thirsty. You will be filled. You'll be filled now. And there's so much more to come in the future. John Stott says, in this life, our hunger will never be fully satisfied, nor our thirst fully quenched. True, we receive satisfaction, which the first beatitude promises. But our hunger is satisfied only to break out again. Even the promise of Jesus that whoever drinks of the water he gives will never thirst is fulfilled only if we keep drinking. You see, the Holy Spirit, as we've discovered before in this series, is the foretaste of the great feast that is going to come in the new heavens and the new earth where those of us who are filled now with God will receive the fullness of all that God has to offer in the then. But we're promised fullness now, but an even greater degree of fullness then. We've discovered Luke 11 and Romans 15 about the promise of the Holy Spirit, but, but consider then, consider what is going to happen in the new heavens and the new earth. Consider the promise, consider the reward. Revelation 7, 16, never again will they hunger, never again will they thirst. The sun will not beat down on them, nor any scorching heat, for the lamb will be at the center of the throne and will be their shepherd. He will lead them to springs of living water and God will wipe away every tear from their eyes. Then in Revelation 21, 6, he said to me, it's done. I'm the alpha and the omega, the beginning and the end. To the thirsty, I will give water without cost from the spring of the water of life. Those who are victorious will inherit this and I will be their God and they will be my children. What God is asking from you tonight is not to hunger and thirst after experiences, but to hunger and thirst after him and you will get him in the now, but gloriously in the then. As we conclude, I love how David Livingstone, another missionary hero of the past, said this, two separate quotes. He said this, I will place no value on anything I have or possess unless it is in relationship to the kingdom of God. He analyzed all of his life and he said, unless what I'm doing is a hungering and thirsting after God, do I really need to do it? And this final quote, towards the end of his life, he said this, my Jesus, my King, my life, my all, I again dedicate my whole self to you. I wonder at the end of this teaching session, will you do that? Dedicate yourself once again to him because he's the God of the second, the third, the fourth, and the fifth chances. He's the God of all grace. And Jesus says this tonight, blessed are those who hunger and thirst for God, for righteousness, for they 
will be filled. Thank you for listening to Deeper Into the Word. We hope and pray it has been a blessing to you. If you have any questions on what you have heard, please send them to deeper at hamiltonroadbaptist.com or comment below the video online and we will base our question and answer session before next week's teaching on your questions. To access more teaching, please visit hamiltonroadbaptist.com forward slash teaching. <laughs>